I'm a medical student, and in the last two weeks, I've been attending the scheduled internship in psychiatry. I happen to be very interested in the subject, to the point of considering it a career path after graduation. And, as it happens, I've gotten into probably the best department I could have ended up in. Or the worst, depending on your point of view. It is a sort of intensive care unit, but for psychiatric patients. They basically get the worst cases, patch them up as best they can, and send them to an appropriate structure. Everything is locked up and strictly controlled, as we get a bit of everything, from those at high suicide risk, to those suffering from bipolar disorder, to schizophrenic people talking to God, who, incidentally, is always their father. The problems with these last ones come when this God tells them to beat up other patients, as, obviously, they are infidels. Things went on, with ups and downs, and the usual problems tied to the profession, such as the guy who walked in and went on to casually announce that he was carrying a number of knives inside his suitcase, or the ex-convict who insisted on coming in the doctor's office because he disagreed with the therapy and decided to sit beside me while vehemently arguing with the on-duty psychiatrist. I kind of hope I was still there, sitting beside the ex-convict and trying to make myself basically invisible. Five days ago, a middle-aged man, I'll call him Mr. R for privacy's sake, came in. He did so of his own volition. In his words, he really needed for them to be silent for a while. R's appearance was a bit peculiar. Balding and stocky, he had a sallow complexion and wore ill-fitting sunglasses, like always outside as well as inside. His mannerisms were unconventional as well. Twitchy and nervous, he seemed to be on the lookout for something. Some might think that it wouldn't be so strange to see someone behaving like that in such a place, but most patients usually looked lost and confused, unfocused, as if they had too many thoughts at the same time, or not enough at all. He was nothing like that. He, at most, seemed slightly distressed. I was given the opportunity and privilege to attend Mr. R's first session, as proposed by the doctor and under the patient's agreement. He agreed. It's safe to say that I was absolutely fascinated by his case. You see, most schizophrenic patients start suffering from an early age, usually around 16 to 18 years old, from auditory hallucinations, which can take different natures. Some insult the person, constantly degrading them to the point of driving them to suicide. Some tell them what to do, and can be rather dangerous. Another common characteristic is that the patients are completely unaware that the voices only exist within their minds, and only they can hear them. R was an exception in every respect. First of all, he introduced his case by stating clearly that he was aware that the figures he saw, he was the only one who saw them. It's the sickness that makes me see them, he said. That's right. He didn't just hear. He saw things. Not people. Figures. He called them demons. Four of them. He could even describe them in detail, citing horns and claws and cold, dark eyes that looked like pure void. They could even turn to a more draconic appearance when they turned more hostile. They could even wear other people's faces as their own to trick him. The first time they appeared was in his mid-thirties. As he came home, he saw them trying to possess his mother, and they tried to use her to kill him, he said. They hadn't left him since, and only meds seemed to keep a hold of them and at least make them silent. He kept telling us about them, adding details and stories each time, until yesterday. Then, something happened. 
During our third session, the psychiatrist asked him where those demons were. R silently pointed at the windowsill, the very same windowsill I was standing next to, silently taking notes. Are they telling you something? Asked the psychiatrist. No, they've been silent as of late. Do they do something? Are they doing something right now? R looked around, a bit in distress, but eventually nodded. What are they doing? When I didn't hear an answer, I looked up from my notes. R was pointing directly at me. What are they doing? Repeated the psychiatrist. They are looking at him, staring. I couldn't help but feel a shiver run down my spine. I knew those were just hallucinations, but his finger pointed at me. His face. It was the stuff of nightmares. Sometimes in the last few days, they disappeared. When I find them again, they're with him. They've been following him. The psychiatrist glared at me with a furrowed brow. Do you know what they want? Do they want to use him to do you harm, like they did with your mother? No. Not at all. They don't want to hurt me. Today, R came directly to me as I was getting ready to go home, taking off my white coat. He took off his sunglasses and looked at me with those eyes, dark and endless, as if made of pure void. Thank you, Doctor. Finally, I'm free. I'm writing this sitting at my desk, a mere half hour later. I'm writing this to make sure someone knows what happened, and that I'm not crazy. Because I can't see anything, nor hear anyone. <laughs> but I can feel their breath on my neck. <laughs> Hi, my name is June. I'm posting this because I'm not really sure what else to do about what I found, and no one is probably going to believe me. Hell, I don't even believe what I'm seeing myself. The thing is, 21 years ago, my friend Kyle disappeared. He wouldn't pick up the phone or answer any message, and he was nowhere to be found. We contacted the police, but they weren't able to find him anywhere either. He simply vanished, no trace anywhere, not even in his apartment. They thought he had just run away. I heard one of the cops saying he ran away with a hot flirt. They didn't know Kyle though, but I do, and that's not like him. Furthering my suspicions, a couple of days prior to his disappearance, he started behaving in a peculiar manner. He's always been quiet and reserved. It took a good while to get to know him, but once you managed to get into his more personal sphere, he was an amazing friend, passionate and warm. The last time I saw him, he was so weird, he looked scared of me, or of something. He looked like he was trying to dodge me. He even refused to look at me in the eyes. I've never seen him like that, so I was worried. And then he just vanished. It's horrible. Today I came back to his apartment again to see if I could find anything new, in the desperate hope we had missed something, and when I tried to put the key in the lock, the door, it just kind of fell. It was unhinged. Here is where I found this absurd note. I don't know what to think about it. It doesn't make sense, and it's not even a suicide note. It's just utter nonsense. 
I don't even know why, but what freaks me out about it the most is that his writing has always been so steady, precise. This is not like him. Never mind how absurd the content is, something very wrong happened. I've transcribed this mess, but the way he wrote it, it gives me chills. It's just wrong. If you're reading this, it probably means you found me, which is bad. I'm not even sure where I am anymore. They've been messing with me, made me see stuff, do stuff. It's been hell. I had to flee, hide. I couldn't let them harm my friends, my family. Those things have been following me for God knows how long. I have several memory lapses. Sometimes they would just hijack my body and I'd lose control of everything and for I don't know how much time. Time. Time feels almost meaningless now. Those demons. They're not demons. They're something else. But they're real. Trust me, I can't see them. No one can. But they are real. I can see their effect on me. I can feel it. Their touch is like hot coals on my skin, bruises and burns appearing in the shape of their claws. They stare like electricity frying my nerves. <laughs> That's not all. When I saw my eyes in the mirror, I knew. Those weren't my eyes, so I started wearing sunglasses. No one can see those eyes. Black pools of pure void. It was not safe for anyone to be near me, so I hid. I was scared of myself. Memories are a blur, unclear, but some stuff I remember distinctly. One woman in particular, well-dressed, elegant, kind eyes. She was married, had a wedding ring. I was lying on the side of the road. I was trying to pull myself together, hadn't eaten in days. She touched me to help me on my feet to see if I was all right. She took off my sunglasses. I so wish she had just ignored me, but she didn't. The look on her face is still burned on my mind. I can still feel their presence passing beside me so clearly as they jumped on the woman. She felt them too. They're with her as well now. At first, I thought they left me, that I was free. Shortly after this scorching of their grip manifested again, as angry as ever. They didn't pass. They spread like a disease. Beware anyone with sunglasses. I don't know what they want. I don't even know if they want. But I met a man who claimed he could see them and that they could talk to him. Don't even try to find him. I tried to search for his name and there's no trace anywhere. No one's bloody seen him. I don't know who he was or what he was. He's the one who attached them to me. I have my ideas. Maybe he was one of them, or maybe he's just like me now, and found a way to get rid of them by passing them directly to someone else. Me, to be more specific. I can't do that to anyone. I could never forgive myself. I've already done enough damage. You probably won't believe me, but please, please, if you see me and I'm alive, you are in danger. Run. There, alongside this note, I found him. He was dead. I won't go into detail. Let's just say I'm trying not to puke. That rusty, metallic smell. 
The blood. It's everywhere. He was my friend, and now he's dead. While I was transcribing those words at Kyle's PC, I thought he had lost his mind. That whatever happened to him shocked him so much that he made up this story to cope with it. Well, right now, I'm starting to be inclined to believe him. Or maybe I'm losing it myself. (laughs) Who knows? But as I'm writing, there's something. I'm not even sure how to describe it. I'm looking at him, and signs are appearing, like someone is carving them on his skin with a knife. But no one is there. I'm not sure what's going on. Maybe I should heed his advice and run. Those are not signs. No. Those are words. They say, Still here. (laughs) Please, help me. A couple of years back, my friend Alex and I became extremely curious about the paranormal. I, of course, was a skeptic, so we would often try and find abandoned locations throughout New Jersey to debunk things. Most places felt extremely normal in the day, but once it got dark, they did feel eerie. But eerie is not the paranormal. I knew it was mainly in my head so I didn't really classify these locations as paranormal. Some notable locations I've been to were 1754 House, Ethrain Asylum, and Empty Walls Mansion. These were locations we heard of and went to visit these locations. There was this one particular location, though, named Essex Mountain Sanatorium. This is where Alex and I had the strangest experience in our lives, Let's start from the beginning. It was 10.30 in the morning, eating breakfast with my dad. My phone vibrated in my pocket as I scooped down the last of my lucky charms. Yes, I know, I ate them despite Liam Neeson's experience in Ted, too. Alex called me on the phone about an abandoned insane asylum near where we live. I was extremely excited when he did. I told him we should go there on Saturday, and stay till the early morning hours. He, of course, agreed. My dad glanced up and looked straight at me in the eye with a creepy smile. So, Duberbop, you planning to do anything different this time so you can actually see some ghosts? He chuckled. No, but do you have any ideas that could help us? I said back. Well, there's this little game my drinking buddies and I used to do when we were camping he said with a wolfish grin on his face, and he proceeded to explain to me a sort of psychological experiment he used to do when he was younger. (laughs) My dad doing experiments when he was younger. My dad only referred to it as the game. The instructions to play were very simple. One, you must play the game between 2 a.m. to 4 a.m., before or after and it won't work. Two, You must be alone during this, and you must have no one watching you, or else you won't feel the loneliness factor you're supposed to. Three, you must go to an area with very little sound and no windows. Must be pitch black with no lights. The last thing he told me was that you had to have all doors around you completely open, and they too must have no lights, sounds, or windows. Sit in the middle of the room looking at the door that is open to both if there are two doors. I told him I would try this when we got there. He nodded and looked back at his newspaper. Fast forward to Saturday with Alex out in my front yard. He was wearing a red polo shirt and black shorts. He sort of looked like an Asian version of Tom Cruise, but a little bit shorter. (laughs) Anyways... He picked me up and about two to four hours in, we arrived at the Essex Mountain Sanatorium. We arrived at night, so the place really did look creepy. 
We bolted in the front entrance and tried to open the front door. It was locked. We found a small window we could fit in, though, and we immediately crawled through it. Pitch black. We couldn't see anything. Alex brought out his flashlight so we could see better. The area we ended up in wasn't so bad. It was a sleeping area for patients, I think, so we didn't really freak out that much. I mean, whether you're dead or alive, you do sleep. It's just a matter of how long. (laughs) Then I remembered about the game my dad told about. I opened the door to the hallway and searched for rooms on which I could find the perfect room for the game. Open doors, no windows. I found a medical area room, so we went to check that out. I told Alex behind me to get to the bedroom area and stay there. He was confused, so I explained to him about my game, and he reluctantly agreed. I set up everything and made sure no lights were there. (laughs) Not that there would be a working light bulb or acetylene lamp in a place this old. I opened the doors and sat in the middle of the room, staring at the two doors. I waited. I suddenly started seeing things after twenty minutes of starting the game. I saw shadows and heard whispers which I realized were my own. I glanced at the dark door to the left and saw a shadow outlined near the door. My brain started giving in to the fear and everything started to get worse. I started seeing my worst nightmares forming in the darkness. The grudge girl in particular took over most of my fears. In the corner of my eye, I saw someone's face. I knew I wasn't hallucinating. I stood up and ran like hell, forgetting about Alex and my panic. I went back to the bedroom after a while though when I realized what I'd done, and I saw Alex still there, also frightened. We pretty much both jumped out of the small window after that. We bolted for home. We went back to the car and started driving. Once inside, we were silent for the nearly two-hour drive. I had the guts to finally speak. I asked Alex why he was so frightened. He told me that the whole time I was alone in the room, he had heard a woman screaming coming from the room I sat in. I guess before this story even starts, I should introduce myself. My name is Danny Hagar. I used to love exploring abandoned buildings with my friends, Stacy, Johnny, and Tyler. Well, used to is kind of a strong way to put it, but nonetheless, it's the best way I know how. My friends and I basically grew up together and were friends since the third grade. Abandoned buildings and places rumored to be haunted always intrigued us ever since we watched videos of them on the internet. I always used to say to my friends, Hey, I think it would be cool if we could explore places like those for ourselves. But where we lived, there weren't many abandoned or haunted places to explore, so we really didn't get to. We all graduated high school around the same time, and we shared a college dorm in the town of Smithport, Wisconsin which was about three or four miles outside of our old town of Bakersfield. Exploring abandoned and haunted buildings was actually pretty fun for a while. We would even find things we wanted that were cool enough to take for souvenirs. There would even be times when we would get legitimately frightened out of haunted places and the next day laugh about it when we were having the time of our lives. One day, however, that all changed when Johnny came running into our dorm with an extremely huge grin on his face. Johnny then proceeded to shove his phone into Stacy, Tyler, and I's face. I may have just found the perfect place for us to explore, Johnny said with pure excitement. What are you talking about, John? Stacy and Tyler asked in unison. Me being a little skeptical, I took John's phone and proceeded to read aloud the news article he had found. Collinsworth Insane Asylum that was shut down in 1956 supposed to be the new hotspot for horror seekers and ghost hunters alike. 
The details inside the article were brief. The place was shut down because of allegations of inhumane research and testing, as well as treatments that were spreading like wildfire. And finally, the government saw that they were true and cut the facility's funding within a year. They were forced then to shut down for good. It sounds a little too good to be true, said Stacy. Tyler and I nodded our heads in agreement. But Danny's always said that we should explore abandoned and haunted places. Well, this place sounded like an amazing combination of both. I even took the liberty of looking this place up. Johnny pulled out a printed image of the place then, and from the looks of it, it was huge. How far is it away from here, though? Tyler asked. Johnny thought for a moment. It's only about ten miles from here. I know because I drove there when you three went to Stacy's parents' house to help them move in. It looks way creepier in person. I even heard it has a huge graveyard with unmarked graves. He said the last part as creepily as he could. I also think it would be even cooler if we were to spend the entire night there as well, Johnny added. We looked at each other for a moment. Finally, after thinking it over a couple of minutes, we agreed to go with Johnny that weekend. On the days before the big adventure was planned, we went to our local supermarket for a few things. Flashlights, lanterns, lots of batteries and snacks, and some sleeping bags. Then the day finally arrived, and we loaded up the van with our gear and set off. I checked the time as we pulled out of the university parking lot and saw that it was exactly 7.30 p.m., and the sun was already setting. By the time we got there it was nine o'clock and the sun had gone down and it got dark rather quickly. For the life of me, I don't know why we left the van at the beginning of the asylum driveway, but I guess Johnny wanted to amp up the creep factor, which worked by the way, and we walked down the dark entranceway that was lined with big oak trees on either side, blocking out the rays of the moon. As we expected, and like Johnny said, it was huge. We walked up toward the giant iron gate that was slightly ajar, and it creaked and groaned as we slowly swung it back and forth. I don't think we should do this, Tyler said quietly. Stacy shook her head in agreement, but managed to choke out. But we're already here. It would have been a waste of fuel not to mention our money to come out here look at that building and only call it quits and go home. In hindsight, I wish I would have listened to Tyler. We all picked up our things with a loud and terrifying creak and we opened the huge iron gate and made our way to the front of the asylum. The first thing that kind of caught me off guard was that the front doors were knocked clean off their hinges and laid on the floor as if someone or something big slammed through them. We turned on our flashlights, and we slowly walked inside the dark room. I shined my flashlight around, and noticed we were standing in the reception area of the asylum. The walls were white in color, with a peeling red line in the middle. We should find somewhere to bunker down for the night, before we start our exploration, Stacy said. We then all agreed to use the medication office on the second floor so we all started toward the stairs and began to climb. After climbing two flights of steps, we finally made it to the second floor and made our way inside the medicine office. We laid our sleeping bags on the dirty floor in a circle, lit the lantern and placed it in the middle. So, where do you think we should explore this place first? Johnny asked. We all shrugged our shoulders and asked Johnny if he had a map. He pulled it out, and we looked it over to decide to just go ahead and explore the entire facility. After all, the night was waning, and we wanted to see as much as we could before we had to leave in the morning, so we agreed and set off. It was about 11 p.m. when we got to the main holding cells of the insane patients. Other than the lights of our flashlights, it was pitch black and quiet as could be in there besides our breathing. We explored that building from top to bottom. Well, almost the bottom, with Johnny disappearing and jumping out and scaring the living hell out of us, and we'd laugh it off. (laughs) 
We even tried to get him back a few times too, but it never really worked. We even heard weird and spooky sounds. Even though they frightened us, we tried to debunk them as wind or things like that. Drafty old building and whatnot. I wish that was the case. I even wished I could say that this exploration went without a hitch, but I'd be lying if I said that it didn't. When we all got to the basement level of the asylum, which is where the complicated systems of winding tunnels were, I immediately felt as if something or someone was watching the four of us and didn't want us there. Stacy must have picked up on that as well as she started to shiver. I, I, I think we should go back to our sleeping area and start to get some rest before we have to drive another ten miles back to the dorm. Johnny just huffed. Oh, come on, you three. Stop being such pansies. I want to see where such tunnels go and find out what's in these different rooms. He then laughed. I even suggest that we split into teams of two. I'll go with Tyler and Stacy, and you and Danny go together. Tyler and I'll go right, and you two will go straight. Stacy, Tyler, and I dreaded the idea of splitting off, and I could feel the presence of something that didn't quite feel right. Johnny, you're absolutely nuts. You've watched countless horror movies with us to know it's a fucking horrible idea to split up, even into teams of two. What if there's something unnatural and evil down there that wants to eat us? And what if it's real? What if it's a killer? What if... Stacy was cut off by Johnny's uproarious laughter. <laughs> really, Stacy? Are you serious? Those movies are fake as hell and you know it. There's nothing down here but us. You'll be fine. You're not going to get killed or eaten. Quit being a little bitch. And with that, Tyler and Johnny disappeared into the tunnel to our right, while Stacy and I went down the tunnel in front of us. Stacy and I walked for what seemed like an eternity. I checked my watch. It was 3 a.m. when I heard a clang as I walked into the big steel door. I rubbed my head as I shined my flashlight on it. There was a placard above the door that read, Morgue, and spray-painted on the door were the words, Warning, stay out. I looked at Stacy, who was still shaking slightly. I reached my hand toward the handle and turned it with ease, opening the door. The smell of death and sharp smell of blood filled our nostrils. I shined my flashlight into the room and almost vomited. Bodies and blood were everywhere and looked relatively fresh. Some of the bodies were mutilated so badly that their blood and entrails were scattered all over the floor, walls, and ceiling. I shined my flashlight over to the corner of the room where the freezers were. Hunched over in the corner, tearing into one of the many fresh corpses, was something that looked like a tall man, about seven to eight feet tall, wearing a deer's skull. Only, it wasn't. The jaws of the skull were moving while it devoured the corpse's flesh. <sighs> I tried to move but couldn't. The thing stopped and suddenly, with a movement too quick for anything natural to move, it stared directly at Stacy and I, its teeth covered in bright crimson gore of its victims. Then, with a loud, terrifying shriek, it suddenly jumped up and charged us. I quickly closed the door as fast as I could, grabbed Stacy's arm and ran down the dark tunnel, listening to the steel door being knocked clean off its hinges, followed by another piercing roar and thunderous footsteps as the thing chased after us. After running for what seemed like hours, we finally ran into Johnny and Tyler, who were exploring the asylum's hospital wing just off the tunnel they were in. We have to get out of here now, Stacy screamed. I turned to her and covered her mouth with my hand. Shh. You need to be quiet or else that thing will attack us and we will never get out of here. Johnny looked confused. What the fuck has you two so riled up? I told him about the morgue, the fresh corpses with their blood and entrails strewn around the room like twisted piñatas. 
I then proceeded to tell him about the monster that chased us. Johnny looked as though he understood, and then he began to laugh loudly. <laughs> You're trying to scare me back, right? I'm going to walk outside this door and prove you that this so-called monster isn't real. Stacy and I desperately tried to warn him to stay in the room, but to no avail. He stepped out into the hall and shined his light all around. We hid in the old lockers when we heard that thing give out a damn shriek. The monster must have tackled Johnny to the floor as we watched helplessly inside the lockers. It tore through his stomach with its claws, pulling out Johnny's entrails. Johnny screamed in agony as the thing was tearing him apart, eating what it could. Poor Tyler was next to go. Tyler started to run from the room, but his efforts were quickly shattered as the monster lunged at him, ripping his head clean from his shoulders with a sickening ripping sound. As I saw that it was distracted, I suddenly realized we might escape and told Stacy that we were going to try to make a run for the exit. We quickly got out of the lockers and we ran past the beast, ran for our lives down the dark corridors. As we ran, we could hear that the thing was no longer distracted with its latest meal. It was now chasing us down once again. Every door Stacy and I ran across during our escape attempt would slam shut behind us, only to hear them get busted down. We ran up the flights of stairs as fast as we could go until we finally made it to the first floor we entered the building. Stacy and I slammed the stairwell door shut behind us and ran through the non-existent front doors and through the gate. Stacy and I had made it halfway down the driveway when Stacy stopped. Then I stopped and turned to see what she was doing. Run, Danny, run! She screamed, but before I could say anything, I heard a shriek again as the beast quickly made its way to her and immediately started to tear her apart. I ran as fast as I could, her devastating screams echoing behind me. When I got into the van, I started it and immediately floored it as fast as I could back to the university. The next day, everyone was wondering where Stacy, Tyler, and Johnny went. I lied to my shame and told them I didn't know where they had gone. One day while I was studying for the upcoming exams, a news bulletin came on, saying that numerous bodies were found inside the asylum. Most were ones inside the morgue. My friend's bodies were all found inside the hospital wing where they were hiding. Seeing them all dead again filled me and continues to fill me with sadness, especially for Stacy. I wish I could have helped her, even though it wasn't for her sacrifice, but I'd be dead along with them. To anyone who's reading this, I ask that you please stay away from the Collingsworth Insane Asylum. There is an evil that lurks there, and it will stop at nothing until you or anyone else with you is dead. I survived because of Stacy's sacrifice. If you decide to go there to see it yourself, don't say I didn't warn you. I walked down the long, dark hallway. A sense of paranoia begins to creep through my body. As my shoes click on the tiles, I begin to imagine entities lurking within the shadows. I imagine gruesome monstrosities skulking inside abandoned rooms. I try to force myself to relax. Even if there were demons in the rooms, they could not escape the confines of each room. You see, this is an asylum. And who might I be? Uh, just a mental patient, doomed to wander these corridors with my delusions to drive me to madness? No, no. I'm actually a tough-as-nails warden, the only one responsible for this job. <laughs> I'm also the only one willing to do this task of delivery. I carry a tray of food. It smells delicious, 
but knowing who it is going to spoils my appetite. I finally arrive at the soundproof door at the other end of the hall. I grip the metal food tray in my left hand, fumbling for the keys in my pocket with my right. I finally feel the familiar metal of the key and slowly insert it inside the lock. It makes a low, clicking noise as I twist it. I place my palm on the cold metal of the door and push. Instantly I'm greeted with echoing giggles. This inmate is different. He's not like the others. The others moan, they groan, talk to themselves or scream. All this one does is laugh. There are others who laugh, of course, but they soon break down from their laughter and cry. This one, though, is always giggling or occasionally breaks into fits of hysterical laughter. He doesn't wear a straitjacket, for the last man to attempt to force one on him ended up in the intensive care unit. For the sakes of the other inmates, we abandoned this wing of the institution and put him alone up in here. Surprisingly, he went in rather willingly. I can't begin to imagine willingly going into this small, white room with no windows behind thick iron bars behind a soundproof door. Once he had gone in there, he sat in the little corner, just sat there so he could laugh in peace. I begin to try and hum and whistle to tune out the dreadful laughter, but to no avail. I don't believe I was even humming a tune. Ah, if I'm not mistaken, he's laughing a bit harder at this. Was he laughing at me? Did he think of this as a a joke? I gripped the tray a little tighter. Here, dinner, I say, placing the tray inside the small drawer. He gets to his hands and knees and crawls over to the bars, still giggling. (laughs) What's for dinner? (laughs) I close the drawer while the same time he opens another drawer where the tray is waiting. He pulls out the food tray and places it on the ground. He then pulls over the cover. Meatloaf, potatoes and water, I reply. (laughs) <laughs> so, <laughs> so tell me, why am I treated to such a gourmet delicacy in this prison? This isn't a prison. It's a mental institution with unorthodox methods. <laughs> I should say so. And with that, he begins to eat. I step back, repulsed. Along with that horrid laughter, he sports a wide smile on his face. His grin never falters, never vanishes as he eats. It seems to stand out today. Tell me, why do you always smile in that manner? He stops eating and glances at me, still grinning that hideous smile. Isn't it nice to smile? His question sounded like more of a statement. Why? Why must you continue to smile day and night? Something must be going well for you. At those words, his broad grin appeared to extend over his pale face. As a matter of fact, something is. But what could? He raises his hand, silencing my stutters. At this point, Warden, you must believe I have a devious plan in mind. To escape? Well, I don't. I'm happily content here. Happily content. I'm completely confused. Nobody really talked to him. So had he somehow lost his ability to communicate normally? You're not answering my question, I exclaimed. He seemed unfazed by my sudden outburst. You wouldn't want to know the answer, he replied. Was this some kind of sick mind game? Please tell me, I begged. In my desperation, 
I hadn't realized that I, the warden, was begging this mental patient for information. He sighed. I suppose you should know, but I warn you, this information will cost you your very sanity. <laughs> I thought he was speaking crazy talk. I thought he was pulling my leg. I thought this was nothing. He beckoned me closer to the rusty iron bars. I obeyed his summons without fear of him grabbing my ear or head through the bars, but he did nothing. Nothing except simply cupping his hands over my ear and whispering into it. I, I couldn't believe what I heard. He told me the meaning of life, the place of origin. He told me the fate of this world. All the signs he pointed out are true. He was right about it all, like me paying the price with my sanity. I was dragged in here last night. I refused to wear the straight jacket, and they won't make me. Now that I know the truth, the voices, they talk to me. They feed me information that makes me... <laughs> that makes me laugh. I laugh and giggle night and day, day and night, never resting. Knowing the fate of this world is disastrous, but knowing what will happen to me and those like me makes me... <laughs> makes me smile. Before my experience two days ago, May 3rd and 4th, 2013, I was a very skeptical person, not just in the paranormal, but in all areas of my life. Should something not be able to factually be proven, I simply believed it wasn't true. While I was always interested in death, the paranormal, and spooking myself in general, I had always been a hard-headed person who never believed that any of it was truth. I simply wrote things off as an interesting story and never genuinely believed that anything unexplained happened. Following my experiences, however, I've come to terms with the fact that just because things do not follow our illusion of reason does not mean that those things are actually valid. As I stated before, I have a greater goal in mind higher than simply entertaining my fellow creepypasta members and fans of True Scary. Contrary to my previous belief, there are things in life that cannot be explained, like the beginning of the universe, life itself. We can trace these things back in theory, 13.7 billion years ago theory with the Big Bang. But the further into it you go, the more questions arise, the less certainty there is. And what was before that, and before that, Great wars have been fought over the topic ever since the beginning of man himself. We are all fighting and scrambling to answer the unexplainable origin of the beginning of the universe. Why? Simply put, we are all very intrigued about a topic that is so complex and abstract, despite the fact that it could never really be explained. To me, this is why creepypasta stories, true or false, are captivating. We all want to feed our hunger with a glimpse into the irrational world of the paranormal and incomprehensible. My goal above is to show my peers that you must keep an open mind and simply give in to the inevitable truth, that some things in life cannot be explained. I apologize for the long prefix, but I felt it was absolutely necessary to do so. Here are my experiences on May 3rd and 4th. Seeing how it was Friday on May 3rd, I was very glad to be on a small but much appreciated break from work and school. Naturally, I did the old teenager cliché of spending the night at a friend's house. As usual, I indulged in playing lots of video games and criticizing old classic movies with my good buddy Chris. We were a couple of film buffs, at least self-described, who loved to share impressions of actors and poke fun at poorly done special effects that kind of thing. 
That night was honestly going great in a true weekend fashion. My friend and I had just come to the realization that he could do a pretty good Nicolas Cage impression too, so we spent a large portion of that night laughing and talking like him at random points in our hangout. When I attempted to follow in and give the impression a try, he shot me down and ridiculed me for doing a bad job. I shrugged and tried to laugh it off, but he continued to pursue berating me. Eventually, I grew tired of this negative criticism, and we had a small argument. It was no big shouting match or anything. We were used to this sort of thing because we made fun of each other all the time and sort of on a regular basis. It was only natural to have a little fight now and then. We always got over it within a day or two, though. I felt the best course of action was to gather my things and ride my bike home so we could both cool off a little. I was reluctant, though, to bike home because it was already really late. I was no stranger to riding home in the dark. It was actually a sort of routine because I got around a lot. It seemed I was always riding home in the late hours from someone's house. This time was different, however, because it was now 1.24 in the morning, May 4th now. I had only ever ridden my bike past midnight once or twice for an absolute emergency. I refrained from riding when it was very late because I always had a fear of gangs and other not-so-great characters who tended to be out at that time of night. Clouded of my better judgment by pride and anger, though, from the interaction we had just had, I put on my backpack, hopped on my bike, and blindly started off. I recalled the cool summer breeze that I had felt as soon as I began to ride home. It was very therapeutic to feel the wind relieving me of my stresses. I was now confident that I had made the right call to leave my friend's house, rather than stay there and wait in awkward silence until we both fell asleep. I continued to ride home for another ten minutes. At this point, I was at a crossroads. Did I ride down Van Ness, or turn and head toward the main road where the hookers and gangsters usually hang out? I continued to go straight and head down Van Ness. Although this seemed like a no-brainer, it took some thinking and a fair amount of guts. Van Ness was a very tranquil street. It was filled with tall pine trees, very old pine trees, little traffic, and a biker's paradise. At night, however, it was very different. Van Ness was a bit of a historic part of town, so it did not have street lights. There were so many trees that even the moonlight could not really sneak through to illuminate the street. Me and my friends frequently joked that this was the darkest street in the world. Aside from being very dark, it was also quiet. So quiet that even the sound of crickets chirping would be relieving, because you would know that at least you were not completely alone. I had been riding on the street for a while now, and only about three quarters of a mile remaining until I was at my street. I had gotten kind of used to this street, creep factor aside, and I was no longer a bit nervous about the spookiness. The spookiness seemed more like a solitude and was actually quite refreshing, as refreshing as the summer breeze. During the day, I frequently rode down Van Ness. As I had mentioned, it was a mecca for bikers. I was very familiar with all the buildings and fields on that stretch of road, so when I saw an unfamiliar building, it stuck out like a sore thumb. At the end of the long, dry field stood a tall, menacing mansion of a home, like straight out of a classic horror movie. I could totally imagine a thunderstorm in the background adding to the horrifying look of it. It was more pre gambrel style than true Victorian. I stopped pedaling and slowly passed the building by. The curiosity of the building began to burn a hole into my head. I knew that if I did not stop and analyze it, I would lose sleep wondering at what I had missed, so I turned around, dismounted from my bike, and stared at the building in awe. On the front of it was a green text, the same green that was used on this historic part of town in Van Ness. I was nearsighted, which meant that I needed to wear my prescription glasses to see far away. I reached in my pockets 
and realized that I had left my glasses at Chris's house in my hurry. Damn. I decided that I would have to get a closer look if I wanted to read what it said. I was way too enthused to simply call it a night on that note. I had to at least read what it said. I stepped onto the crunchy, dry field and proceeded to walk toward the building. My imagination was running wild, thinking of what on earth this sign would read. My mind was drawing blanks now as to what I thought it could have said. Finally, I got close enough to make out the words, Van Ness Asylum. Under that was a smaller subtext that I could not yet read. I did not know if I should continue to walk toward it, instead run like hell out of there. Once again, I figured I had to at least read the subtext. I walked a little closer and read the smaller print. Hmm, 978 North Van Ness. I was so puzzled. I was so sure that I had seen this terrifying building before. I definitely would have looked inside it and at the very least remembered that it was there. It was not often that you see an asylum, you know. Second, why would there be an asylum in the middle of all these nice homes in the first place? All of the homes surrounding the asylum itself looked to be built around the same period. The homeowners would have gone mad had they known a loony bin was built right next door. Wouldn't they? The asylum was obviously abandoned as it was shown by the broken windows and poor upkeep. So at the very least, why wouldn't the neighbors have petitioned to have the building torn down in recent years? None of this was adding up. I decided I should call someone, at least to get their opinion. And should I go in? Then the grim reality reminded me that it was about two in the morning. All of my family and friends were asleep. Maybe not Chris, but he might still be mad at me. I contemplated going in by myself and paced back and forth with the idea. My entire life, I had been a kind of play-it-safe guy, afraid to branch out and try new things. In the past two years, I had tried to embrace the spontaneous side of life and try and learn to say yes. I had to be absolutely nuts, though, to go into an asylum on a dark street at two in the morning, by myself, mind you. But imagine what you'll find. I recalled watching YouTube videos of people like Exploring with Josh, who would break into, uh, excuse me, politely explore condemned asylums and see what they found. The idea fascinated me, but at the same time, I didn't think I had it in me. I couldn't possibly. Could I? Once again, clouded by my better judgment, this time by intense curiosity and the drive to take a chance and explore, I proceeded for an opening into the building. I circled it and gave reasons, like that hole is too small, or I'd rip my t-shirt there for sure. Soon, I realized I was making sorry excuses to delay the exploration. I psyched myself up and crammed myself through the broken window. Once inside, I saw no signs of graffiti, old soda cans or cigarette butts that would imply that anyone had been there since it was boarded up and deserted. The absence of this detritus scared me. If someone had been there before, I would have at least known whatever dangers may be in here, someone had encountered them before me. I had a very annoying habit of scaring myself when having a clear, non-timid mindset was important. I used the flashlight that I attached to my bike and navigated through the dark, cold building. Because this was virgin ground since the boarding up, the inside of the asylum was very well preserved. The white, flawless tile flooring still looked very sterile. Trust me when I say, neatness was much more scary than if the place was a wreck. In fact, it was very freaky. Papers were scattered about from where they were extracting files and sensitive patient information. But other than the papers, the place was pristine, spotless, no mirrors broken, no cracked porcelain toilets or tubs, no urine and excrement all over the walls like you would expect. Next, 
I focused on paying attention to where I was and where I was headed. Where were the patient's bunks? Where were the operating rooms? And where was the morgue? It seemed I was in the admissions area where you would be checked in and out. I walked down a narrow hallway and found a cluster of operating rooms. They were complete with the antiseptic metal tables stripped of all warm, comfortable sheets and pillows. To my chagrin or the preservation of my sanity, I didn't find any scalpels or bone saws. I presumed that these tools had been removed for safety concerns. I scavenged through drawers and found surgical tubing, respirator masks, sterile gloves still sealed in their boxes. It was so odd to see that aside from the scattered papers and no chairs or furnishings, the place still contained a lot of things necessary in keeping it an operational facility. I continued through the asylum and found that the pattern on the floor had changed. The tiles were a different color now, almost a yellowish brown. In fact, the tiles were also very much smaller. I noticed that every few feet there were drains on the floor. I looked up and around and saw lockers where I assumed scrubs and other gear were stored. I put it all together and made the conclusion that I was in the morgue. The drains had been strategically placed to allow for the draining of the blood on the floor. A truly haunting thought. My whole time in there, I heard a few creaks and whatnot, but just blamed them on my stepping and the age of the floor on which I was walking. I had been in there about six minutes when finally I heard something that absolutely made my stomach drop. The only thing I could assume the sound was was a drawer to the morgue refrigerator slamming shut, the large lockers where the deceased are stored before burial. I did not explode and bolt out of there though. I knew that if I had done that, I would have gotten really scared, scared that something was right behind me chasing me. I tried to keep calm though and walk out of that place without a panic. But in the back of my mind, I knew that I had never been so scared in my life. After an eternity, it seemed I jumped out of the window and landed back on the porch of Van Ness Asylum. I ran through the field and got onto my bike and rode home. But it was not like my endeavor was over. I still had to ride nearly a mile home in anguishing fear on the dark, deserted streets. Soon I was home safe and sound. I was so shaken up that I didn't think I could return to living a normal life again. Falling asleep that night was, as you can imagine, very difficult. I pushed through it, though, and the next day I actually felt a lot better. Now, suppose I could have sullied the story by making up some nonsense about how I saw a figure, or something touched me, or there was blood all over the walls or floor. I know that some people would prefer to have those truly horrifying experiences, or at least would prefer to have them in a story like this. But for me, I wanted to stay true to heart and not spoil a true and scary story. Need not worry, however. But here is the paranormal, truly unexplainable part. Yes, there is that part to this story too. The next day, I called up my friend Chris and it seemed both of us were done being mad, thankfully. As a result, I told him about what had happened and my experience the previous night. He was so intrigued that he invited me over, and I told him I'd be there in an hour. I rode to his house and was there in about 40 minutes. I must have pedaled faster than normal. I was very excited to tell him about it in person. He was so amazed, in fact, that he decided he wanted to go and look at the asylum for himself. He too rode down Van Ness at least twice a year and did not recall seeing an asylum himself, day or night. I was very much still traumatized by the last night, though, but at the same time, I really wanted to show off the fact that I had gone into that scary fucking place all by myself. In the end, we both decided we'd take a bike ride down Van Ness to see the building. When we arrived there at about 3 p.m. 30 minutes later, we had some trouble finding the house. 
I recalled the length and shape of the field of the asylum and saw a field that matched it, except for no menacing asylum on top of it. <sighs> this didn't make any sense. It didn't add up, just like the asylum being there in the first place. <sighs> I didn't understand. But as I stated earlier, there are just some things in life you cannot explain. In Anoka County, Minnesota, there's an old mental asylum that borders the high school. I'm talking right up next to it, sharing a fence and everything. My mom had said that when she went to school there in the 1970s, she'd see patients walking around the grounds. Sometimes they'd come right up to the fence edge and watch mom's tennis team practice. <laughs> I guess there are old graves in one of the old courtyard corners too which makes sense, actually, as it's been a running hospital since 1898. It no longer serves as a mental hospital, thank God, but it is now a recovery center for troubled teens and addicts. The underground tunnels are non-functioning, and for all intents and purposes are closed, but it is still patrolled. I can't imagine recovering from substance abuse or being in juvenile detention in a place like that with its history. With its reputation, obviously it's been a victim to a number of stupid vandalisms. Teens sneaking into the property to ghost hunt or whatever. Also, obviously, I have been one of them. <sighs> it was 2005. I was in high school and dating this guy named Max, who volunteered for the fire department. His dad was the chief. All the minor volunteers were given a rotation of duties. Now, normally a minor volunteer wouldn't be asked to patrol the asylum, but since Max's dad was chief, and Max had been volunteering there for three years now, and they were understaffed because of a massive storm, it knocked down trees, flooding, power outages, he had asked if Max could patrol the tunnels for a week to help. This was our chance. I was in the middle of finals, but was done with school for the year that Thursday. I thought a cool end-of-the-year exploration of the building would be an epic summer starter, and he said he'd let me know after his first night what it was like, and if I'd even be able to sneak in down there. On Tuesday morning, I heard from him, because I went to class saying that the tunnels were cool and creepy. He said he had patrolled alone, so I should be able to sneak down there with him for a bit, but might not be able to patrol with him on the actual grounds perimeter, which was fine. All I really cared about were the tunnels. He also said to bring a flashlight, because there was a short period of time where he had to turn off the light before turning on another, and the wiring was all wonky in that old place. On Wednesday morning he said there was a smell down there, and that I should bring water shoes. Some of the flooding had backed up into the tunnels, and the smell was likely a sewage break or a bunch of drowned rats. However, when I got down there, the water wasn't very deep, but it was gross to him. On Thursday morning, he told me to meet him on the path behind the asylum at 10 p.m. It ran along the river. I was a little creeped out by the idea of walking alone down that path at night, but in the end, I decided it would be fine. I told my friend Anna where I'd be, and said to text her a code word every hour to let her know I was okay. The code was a line of lyrics from a Tenacious D song. <laughs> One word each hour, sent in order. I may like creepy things, but I really am a huge pansy. Believe it or not, I've dressed in ghost hunter stuff. In other words, all black, with a hood in my rain boots. I held keys in my hands like a weapon. You know that thing you do in case someone attacks you and you think, hmm, I'll jab them with my keys and then they'll leave me alone. <laughs> Knock on wood. Max was waiting when I got there, so I didn't have to wait alone, which was great. We started weaving our way down through the property, all the while avoiding light posts. We got to the entrance. 
It was one of those concrete entryways that immediately led to descending stairs. We headed in. The usual graffiti was present, iterations of fuck and penis sketches, and a bit of it that was just the word no repeating. I turned on my flashlight and we headed down. At the base of the stairs, it smelled like absolute shit. It was also at least 10 degrees cooler. Max clicked on the light switch at our end and we started off. There was nothing remarkable about the tunnel. It was just a bunch of empty, mostly doorless rooms, an inch or so of putrid smelling water and a few pieces of destroyed furniture. I routinely looked through every room and he waited in the main tunnel. The rooms were ten foot cubes. I both expected to find something horrible and also feared I'd find something ghostly. Most of the rooms were harmless though, just kind of gross decay. Honestly, I was kind of disappointed. It hadn't been the adrenaline rush I'd hoped for. There were four rooms at the other end that looked particularly beat up. Max explained that they had been holding cells for patients that were having episodes and needed isolation. These were the only rooms with intact doors. I made him come in with me because I was paranoid that the door would suddenly slam shut and there was no way I would then be able to go out and be haunted alone. I started inspecting. Nothing interesting in the first two rooms. In the third, though, I found some indents in the bottom corner of the back wall. After inspecting for a bit, I realized that they were fingernail marks. The worst part about them was imagining the position someone would have to be in to make them, crouching on the floor with their back to the door. I found a few more spots of these claw marks, all bundled together, marks going in different directions. Most of them were clustered around the bottom of the room or corners, but there was one group of scratches, about nine feet up on the wall. I guessed maybe the person was standing on the bed and just going to town, but the unusual height still bothered me. At this point, that was enough. I really didn't need a lot of creepy stuff to fill my quota, so I was ready to leave. Max understood but also thought that I should check out the last room, since I had looked in all the others. I wanted to leave, but my OCD and my curiosity was like, you totally need to look in that last room. You have to complete the dungeon crawl. So I went in and made him stand right by me. We started going over the walls, but found nothing. I kept going back to the corner since that's where I had found the first marks in the other room. I bent down to look at what I thought was another mark on the wall and noticed that there were marks also on the floor. It was hard to see since there was water over everything, but by swishing my foot back and forth, I could just make it out. The word no repeating. Now I was done. I stood up and turned to Max and then stopped. We had been so focused on looking at the floor with the flashlight, we didn't realize the light in the tunnel had gone out. I fucking all out screamed. Max grabbed the light from my hand and charged down toward the opening. I followed in a panic. He looked one way and then the other with the light, before dashing toward the stairwell to hit the corresponding light switch. I waited in the hallway, pressed against the wall, eyes down. I did not want to close them, even though I couldn't see anything anyway, but I didn't want to look around either. I was afraid I'd see a shape in the claw mark room across from me. Moments later, Max had the tunnel light on and was grabbing my arm. Thank God he's an emergency responder and could just act on instinct. I was useless. We ran up the stairs and out the other side. I had another brief moment of panic when he took the flashlight and went back down to turn the light back off to complete his patrol. I thought for sure he would be pulled out of view by an invisible force or that some terrible creature would crawl up the stairs after me, 
but it was nothing like that. Thing is, I'd never go back, but Max had one more night of patrol. Think about spiders on their webs. Eight long, thin legs hold on effortlessly to white strands. They stay so seemingly still, they become nearly invisible. Yet you know they are there, waiting for a victim to fall into their bitter trap, only to be devoured from the inside, slowly, mercilessly. That's like Harley. That's what he does to you. My half-brother Jacob and I had always been very close. He and I could talk about anything and everything together. We trusted each other and had one of the best brother-sister relationships that everyone should be jealous of. He was just two years older than me. We looked very alike too. Solid grey eyes, dark brown hair and fair skin. He was very tall though. He was the best player at Fexton's high basketball team. He was very passionate about the sport, always was. We had the same mother and lived with her. I never met my dad. He had left before I was born. But his dad lived in the town next to Fexton and Jacob would visit him often. He always talked about his dad with a gleam in his eye. It was obvious that Jacob loved his dad immensely. Around August when I was fifteen, I noticed a drastic change in Jacob. He was refraining from talking to anybody, even me. Me, his best friend, his own sister. He spent days locked up in his room too. I don't even know how he would get his food or go to the bathroom. He was just always in there. Then, in mid-September, my mother called me down to her room. Jacob was still in his room, silent. I made my way down the stairs. She told me to sit at the foot of her bed. That's when she told me. Jacob's dad passed away. That's why he's been acting this way. I became furious at her for not telling me sooner. After a few minutes of pointless arguing, I walked out of the door, through her living room, and out of the house. I made my way down the sidewalk along the road, the cold air hurting my lungs. I needed to cool off. About an hour later I returned. I jogged up the stairs, but paused by Jacob's room. Hesitantly, I opened his door. It creaked. Everything was so dark, I couldn't see. Jacob, I said quietly. I walked into his room, my hand on the wall trying to find the light switch. I'm so sorry, Mom has just told me. There he was, dead. Hanging inside the closet, across the room was his body, his face pale, lips blue. My brother had killed himself. Weeks passed, and I was severely depressed and traumatized. I couldn't sleep. I barely ate. Breathing was a burden to me. I was miserable. Without my brother, I felt so alone. It was then I realized he wasn't my only best friend. He was my only friend. And now he was gone forever. One night in late October, I had had enough. I couldn't take the pain anymore. It was all too much for me. I couldn't bear it. Silently, I slipped into the kitchen and grabbed the sharpest steak knife there. I crawled back up to my bedroom and collapsed, crying hysterically. I held the blade tightly and pressed it up against my arm. It did hurt but not as much as I thought it would. I did the same to my other arm. I fell onto the floor then, bleeding and drifting off into what I hoped was absolute death. When I woke up, I was in a white room. 
I smelled stale medicine and heard something beeping. God, I was in a hospital. She's awake, someone said, and I heard a sudden rush of footsteps coming my way. A doctor, two nurses, and some man in a black suit stood there. My mom was nowhere in sight. When I asked about her, the questions went through one ear and out the other. I was sure she had found me in my room, but where would she have gone? After a series of questions and examinations, the man in the black suit told me he'd be taking me to a safe place until he was sure I was ready to go home. I was confused until I read the logo on the clipboard he held. Ginger's Asylum. I didn't want to go. Hell, I just wanted to die, get all of this bullshit over with. But I didn't put up a fight. I didn't want to make things worse. Needless to say, I was brought to the asylum, put in a room with only a mattress and a pillow on the floor. Paintings hung on the walls, made by other patients. The first few days and nights there, I put myself in the fetal position, moving only to take my meds and to force myself to eat. It was horrible. It made me want to die even more. How long will I be here? I asked one of the nurses who had come in to check on me. She jumped, startled by the fact that I had said anything at all. She looked at me confusingly, as if she was realizing I was in the room with her. Then her face cleared. About a week or two, she said plainly. Obviously, she had answered the question numerous times. My jaw dropped. Two weeks? She nodded and left the room. I put myself into the fetal position once more and allowed myself to cry. That night, unable to sleep, I stood from the bed. The bandages were tight around my arms. I opened the door silently, and it luckily didn't creak. The hallway was dimly lit and empty. I walked out cautiously and made my way down the hall, headed wherever my legs would take me. There was an eerie feel to the quiet asylum especially since the dark skies didn't illuminate through the windows. However, knowing I had watched one too many horror movies about these places, I brushed off the feeling and kept on walking down the hall. I soon came to a flight of stairs. Not thinking, I made my way down. It soon became pitch black, but I kept on walking. The stairs seemed to go on and on for miles and miles. Then I realized that not even the elevators went down this way. I knew I shouldn't have gone then, but I was too distracted by the rage and sadness I felt. Suddenly, small sounds and creaks made it clear just how ancient this part of the building was. I guessed the workers here hadn't put any signs up to prevent anyone from going here, because any sensible person would have turned away long ago. When I realized I had begun walking on flat ground, I noticed the air smelled like old wood. I sneezed as the dust gathered up into my nostrils. I didn't care about the cool air crawling up my spine. I didn't care about the odd feeling I had down here. Normally, I'd be terrified of this darkness, but my mind was too clouded with self-hatred and misery to feel fear. I walked on into the blackness, not seeing anything for what felt like hours. Then, I suddenly stopped in my tracks. In the distance, there was a dim light. I continued toward it, goosebumps on my arms from the dropping cold. When I made it there, I realized there was a light bulb illuminating an old-looking, rusted door. A handwritten sign in smeared ink read, Caution, do not enter. (laughs) I snickered a little. 
Nothing could hurt me now. I was sure I had reached the limit in mental and emotional pain. Physical pain seemed so small now, so weak. I stared at the door when I realized I was attracted to it. It is hard to explain. It was almost as if someone was calling me toward it. I absentmindedly reached out for the door handle when I suddenly felt uncontrollably sick. I looked in the other direction and threw up everywhere. I wiped my mouth with my arm and turned back to open the door. This time, I managed to get the handle without barfing, but as my fingers rested on it, I couldn't help but feel extremely sick. I brushed it off as some nausea from the medicine. I turned the handle and pushed the door open. I emptied my stomach again. Looking up into the room, I saw there was a single old light bulb hanging from the ceiling. The empty space was thrown in dark orange light, making the corners very dark. I'll admit, I began to get pretty scared here, but what happened next is unexplainable, at least to me. Something behind me shoved me full into the room, and then the door slammed shut. My heart pounded heavily against my chest as hot, suffocating air poured into my lungs. I was shaking violently, throwing up everywhere. I think it was the silence afterwards that terrified me most. Everything was quiet, still. There was nothing in this room apart from the four walls, but it seemed abnormally quiet. Something wasn't right here at all, especially now that I was locked inside some room in the deepest part of Ginger's asylum. I slid against the door to my knees, staring at the wall as sweat trickled down my face, almost as if I was waiting for the wall to grow arms and slam me into it over and over until my skull was crushed. Suddenly, from the corner of my eye, I saw something move. Instinctively, I turned. Nothing. My eyes must be playing tricks on me. But then it happened again and again, and yet again. Then a shadow appeared before me. It was in the shape of a person, a short person, perhaps a child. But what I heard next wasn't a child's voice, not even a human voice. What I heard was enough to send violent chills down my spine, making the fear pump through my veins like venom. Hello there, Jessica, it said with an emphasis on the S in my name. Its voice sounded like ten put together. <sighs> How do you know my name? Get me out of here, I whined desperately, my voice trembling. But this was only responded to by horrid laughter. I'm highly silly. I know everyone's name, it said mockingly. The shadow then darted from the center of the room to the dark corner. You can't just leave yet. I screamed. I was terrified. Don't be scared, little Jessica, it said. Harley doesn't want to hurt you. What do you want with me then? My body was cemented into the spot. I couldn't move. I don't even know how I managed to speak. Harley wants to be your friend, Jessica. We can be best friends forever. I began to scream louder and louder. It got out of its corner and made its way to me. Mm, don't be afraid, Jessica. Little Jessica. Harley just needs a friend. It moved closer and closer. I was paralyzed. Forever. Its voice echoed through my ears. Suddenly, an unseen voice made my mouth open, and I saw the creature sliding into me. 
When it had gone completely, I began to cry. I heard it speaking to me. Harley wants to keep you safe, it said. You belong to me now. I now couldn't stop screaming or crying. I stood yanking on the door handle and broke it. The door slid open. I darted out into the darkness. Stop that, it said. The creepy, childlike tone faded away. Now it was a bitter, demonic tone. Go back now. Tears rolled down my face as I ran into the blackness anyway, knowing there was a being inside of me, in my soul. Stop running, it screamed in my head. A sharp pain shot through my neck all the way down to my knees, making me collapse. I tried to get back up, but every time I moved a muscle, it felt as if part of my body was being dipped in acid. Harley just laughed at my painful screams. Bones began to snap. He was breaking me from the inside. I threw up then even more. The taste in my mouth was now metallic. Blood. Stop doing this to me, I cried, but he only laughed even more. You should have listened to Harley, it said continuing to break me. Be careful. Always keep the lights on. Never go into abandoned rooms. Don't go exploring at night, and never think, not even for a second, that the shadows you see from the corners of your eyes are just optical tricks. Because Harley is always looking for new friends. <laughs> But most importantly, always listen to Harley. A couple of years back, my friend Alex and I became extremely curious about the paranormal. I, of course, was a skeptic, so we would often try and find abandoned locations throughout New Jersey to debunk things. Most places felt extremely normal in the day, but once it got dark, they did feel eerie. But eerie is not the paranormal. I knew it was mainly in my head, so I didn't really classify these locations as paranormal. Some notable locations I've been to were 1754 House, Ethrain Asylum, and Empty Walls Mansion. These were locations we heard of and went to visit these locations. There was this one particular location, though, named Essex Mountain Sanatorium. This is where Alex and I had the strangest experience in our lives. Let's start from the beginning. It was 10.30 in the morning, eating breakfast with my dad. My phone vibrated in my pocket as I scooped down the last of my lucky charms. Yes, I know. I ate them despite Liam Neeson's experience in Ted, too. Alex called me on the phone about an abandoned insane asylum near where we live. I was extremely excited when he did. I told him we should go there on Saturday and stay till the early morning hours. He, of course, agreed. My dad glanced up and looked straight at me in the eye with a creepy smile. So, Duberbop. You planning to do anything different this time so you can actually see some ghosts? He chuckled. No, but do you have any ideas that could help us? I said back. Well, there's this little game my drinking buddies and I used to do when we were camping. He said with a wolfish grin on his face. And he proceeded to explain to me a sort of psychological experiment he used to do when he was younger. <laughs> my dad, doing experiments when he was younger... My dad only referred to it as the game. The instructions to play were very simple. 1. You must play the game between 2 a.m. to 4 a.m., before or after and it won't work. 2. You must be alone during this, and you must have no one watching you, or else you won't feel the loneliness factor you're supposed to. 
3. You must go to an area with very little sound and no windows. Must be pitch black with no lights. The last thing he told me was that you had to have all doors around you completely open and they too must have no lights, sounds, or windows. Sit in the middle of the room looking at the door that is open to both if there are two doors. I told him I would try this when we got there. He nodded and looked back at his newspaper. Fast forward to Saturday with Alex out in my front yard. He was wearing a red polo shirt and black shorts. He sort of looked like an Asian version of Tom Cruise, but a little bit shorter. (laughs) Anyways, he picked me up and about two to four hours in, we arrived at the Essex Mountain Sanatorium. We arrived at night, so the place really did look creepy. We bolted in the front entrance and tried to open the front door. It was locked. We found a small window we could fit in though, and we immediately crawled through it. Pitch black. We couldn't see anything. Alex brought out his flashlight so we could see better. The area we ended up in wasn't so bad. It was a sleeping area for patients, I think, so we didn't really freak out that much. I mean, whether you're dead or alive, you do sleep. It's just a matter of how long. (laughs) Then I remembered about the game my dad told about. I opened the door to the hallway and searched for rooms on which I could find the perfect room for the game. Open doors, no windows. I found a medical area room, so we went to check that out. I told Alex behind me to get to the bedroom area and stay there. He was confused, so I explained to him about my game, and he reluctantly agreed. I set up everything and made sure no lights were there. (laughs) Not that there would be a working light bulb or acetylene lamp in a place this old. I opened the doors and sat in the middle of the room, staring at the two doors. I waited. I suddenly started seeing things after twenty minutes of starting the game. I saw shadows and heard whispers which I realized were my own. I glanced at the dark door to the left and saw a shadow outlined near the door. My brain started giving in to the fear and everything started to get worse. I started seeing my worst nightmares forming in the darkness. The grudge girl in particular took over most of my fears. In the corner of my eye, I saw someone's face. I knew I wasn't hallucinating. I stood up and ran like hell, forgetting about Alex in my panic. I went back to the bedroom after a while though when I realized what I'd done, and I saw Alex still there, also frightened. We pretty much both jumped out of the small window after that. We bolted for home. We went back to the car and started driving. Once inside, we were silent for the nearly two-hour drive. I had the guts to finally speak. I asked Alex why he was so frightened. He told me that the whole time I was alone in the room, he had heard a woman screaming coming from the room I sat in. I'm in an asylum deep in the back roads of Pennsylvania. I'm sure that you haven't heard the true story of this place due to the fact that some of the world's worst experiments have been held here, and for the sake of the people, the events that have happened have been mostly covered up. (laughs) The place is called the Penhurst Asylum. The Penhurst Asylum, as you may know, is recognized today as a haunted tourist attraction. But 
I remember it as the hellhole that I called home for many years. I leave you here my journal entry during my time there, while under the experimentation of Dr. Heinrich Chikardian. October 1982 I have been transferred to this place from my former prison in Europe. My new home is called Penhurst, and I guess it was an old school and hospital. Honestly, I wonder why the fuck I was transferred here in the first place. <laughs> well, I guess I have no right to complain since I am sentenced for life. It's better than, you know, the alternative. Actually, now that I think of it, I'd almost rather be dead. To know that all I have to look forward to is an eventual occurrence of death. The desire to go on slowly fades away as the days drag on. I heard rumors from the other inmates that there is a doctor here who has inmates taken to him, and they just disappear. I can tell you now that I do not wish to meet him. Hopefully I don't. February 1983 Over the past four months, the inmates have been disappearing more and more. Even my new friend, Darren. Darren and I met during lunch about two months back. He and I hit it off rather well. Turns out, he also used to live in Pennsylvania just as I had, before we were transferred to Europe and to our new prison home. We discussed why we were here in the first place. I was sentenced for the murder of a family of six. He was sentenced for manslaughter of, I believe, two people. Funny enough, we did not let our past actions corrupt our friendship. We actually looked at it as a form of common interest. But Darren was taken away a few days ago. I'm not entirely sure why. I need to find out what happened to him, and I hope I'm not next. April 1983 The guards in my section seem to be taking different inmates away. I can tell my time is coming. I don't know what to do. Escape? I'm not sure how the hell I'm going to get out of this place. It's too heavily guarded, and I... I... I am coming to my cell. I don't want to die. I don't want to die! March, 1984. He took me. He took me away and did things to me. Unexplainable things. The flash of lights. The blur of red mist. My entire back is burning. He cut it open and performed some kind of surgery on it. I can feel the stitches in my back sealing up where he cut into my flesh. But, but wait. I... I feel something in my back, in the center of my back, on both sides of my spine. I feel some sort of lump on either side. May 1984 The lumps in my back seem to be growing larger. It feels as though they are about to... to, to burst. I can't take the pain anymore. I must find out what the fuck Dr. Heinrich did to me. I'm cutting my back open and taking out whatever it was he put in there. May, 1984. Later that night. I cut my back open with a piece of the mirror that was in my cell. I, I can't take out the lumps though, and they seem to be growing. What the fuck has he done to me? I hear the screaming coming from the upper floors. More prisoners being taken away? Why am I lasting so long? 
What's so special about me? Why can't he just kill me already? I've longed for death, and this sure as hell isn't helping. I may as well slit my own throat with a mirror shard. You know what? I may do so. Wait. I hear guards coming. Oh god, no. Not again. I don't want to see that doctor again. He's going to do horrible experiments to me again. August, 1985. I'm surprised I'm still alive. I guess I've been unconscious for over a year now, or comatose. I'm horribly thin and, well, almost dead. I wish I was. The lumps on my back have grown into large, horn-like bones. These bones ripped through my flesh, and now my back is completely covered in blood. I should be dead. But no. He won't let me die. That insane doctor. If only I could get my hands on him, I'd tear out his throat. November, 1985. I hate how the other inmates look at me in the cafeteria. They see what Dr. Heinrich has done to me, and they stare in fear at the monstrosity that he has created. Actually, I'm surprised that they even feed us in this damned place. Although the portions of food are usually a small plate of steamed chopped potatoes or something simple like that, the fearful eyes of the other inmates focus upon my torn and bloody back. I can feel their stares burning into my mind. Kill them. Kill them. Kill them. I hear those voices inside my head, and the thought of killing every single one of these people sounds absolutely satisfying. January, 1986. I heard the inmates were planning an escape from this hellhole. Sounds like fun. <laughs> I hope to take this opportunity to kill Dr. Heinrich myself and maybe a few of the other inmates that glare at me wherever I'm eating. I decided that I'm going to eat them. Those horrible fucking people I have to deal with, on top of the agonizing pain from the experiment that Dr. Heinrich has done to me, I can't take it anymore! The time is to act now. I will be free from this damned facility, I tell you that. I will start with these arseholes in the cafeteria. Kill them off as quickly and as brutally as possible. Then I will make my escape. I'm ready. I'm ready. January 1986. Later that day. I decided to keep this journal with me so I can remember all of the things I have been through in my time at Penhurst Asylum. Truly, it was a living hell. My favorite part, though, was the very end of my stay. I helped myself to the flesh of the other inmates. I've been so hungry. Not anymore, though. Tearing my way through the asylum, I found the body of my old friend. You might remember his name, Darren. So I did all I could think of. I took the body with me. Supposedly, the building burst into flames on the second floor of the administrative building. Good. That building deserves to burn down. The administrative building. The whole damned thing. I retreated away from the Penhurst Asylum. I can't stand to look at that place. I keep Darren with me in my new home that's a couple of miles away from Penhurst, a small rusty old shack, but it's a better home than any other place I have ever been. The rotting stench of Darren's corpse is getting unbearable though. I guess I'll have to eat him. I wouldn't dare bury him, no. I don't 
want him to waste away in the ground, so why not become a part of me? Lately, I, I've been so hungry. No more bodies to feed on. Normal food just isn't the same now that I have tasted human flesh. <sighs> I must feed. Soon, there is a small town nearby. The young ones look so delicious. Such new and soft skin. Oh, it will be wonderful. I'm sure the adults won't mind if I just took one. <sighs> or a few. Ha 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 